Father God, we do thank you today. Lord, I do, I do know, Lord, that coming before you is a good thing. Lord, I need you. Lord, may we really catch it today, what you're doing. We just give you praise. Thank you for all that is happening. And Lord, as we start this new, new understanding, Lord, may we build a good foundation today. Really understand what it is we're going for. And Lord, may I be concise and understandable. Lord, for that, I, I just give you praise. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, something has been really on my heart for quite a while. This has been a long time kind of, Lord, am I ever going to be able to teach this? Am I, when can I give this? And so it's kind of a shocker to me when he said, okay, this one. Now, you understand that I didn't hear an exact voice out of heaven saying, preach on this one. You know, I didn't get that. Thank you. And I, <laughs> I, what I did get was that every time I turned around, the subject was nailing me. And I'd have every conversation would bring it just, just twisting into that very thing. And it's just like, wow. And so I, I said, man, one of these days, I am going to have to teach on that. And the Lord said, and you could just feel the thing saying, go. You could hear the laughter. Go. I like that. You know, so here we go. What is it? Well called maturity. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Our, this is going to be interesting. How to get there and how to know when you've arrived. <laughs> what in the world is it? Well, this has been kind of fascinating because Christian maturity, well, is there a goal we're supposed to be shooting for? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, mercy day. Is Christian maturity actually obtainable? Yes, now, you're setting yourself up. I'm just asking the question. Your answers are setting yourself up. You know that. Is it obtainable? Yeah. Several of you said, yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. Well, why would I want to be a, a mature Christian? Why would I want this? Why? I mean, come on, you know. And all the way through this, I keep hearing this sentence I, I heard recently that just is, is so funny. It says that it says, growing older is mandatory, growing up is optional. <laughs> okay. Well, what are the benefits of being a mature Christian? What are, what are the, the benefits? What's the cost? Okay. Notice I'm not giving answers to these. Why? Because this is where we're heading. This is where we're going to be answering all these questions as it goes along with it. Well, what if I don't want it? <laughs> you know, God didn't ask you if you wanted it or not. Well, doesn't just maturity just happen naturally? So is this an actual biblical topic? Well, yeah, it is. And wait till you see the passages that we are going to go through. We are going to be digging in depth in some really amazing passages and uh, hitting, them, hitting them heavy. Adulthood. Now, let's go into the natural for a second. Instead of we started going into the, the Christian realm and all this spiritual stuff, let's just go into the natural. What does it mean to be an adult? Now, I've asked this question to several people, and the answers I've been getting have been really interesting. Okay? And, uh, and so I asked Jim. We went out to lunch on Friday during plowing and scraping and snow blowing and all the other stuff we were doing. We decided to go out to lunch. So, in the restaurant, I asked Jim this very question. So, what is an adult? How do you define it? How do you know when someone is an adult? Now, see, in this room, we are all considered adults. Yeah, even, even the critters in the back there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> to a degree. <laughs> as soon as I said that, your mom up here just started going... <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> just yeah, unplug. Here we go. Adulthood. So I've been asking the question: What is the standard? What does it mean to be an adult? 
to be a mature person in society? Well, the first is a person who takes responsibility for their actions. Now, how are we doing? (laughs) I saw a cartoon once that had this pedestal and big base, and it had this statue of this guy on it, and this guy's reading the plaque on the statue. And, you know, the guy's saying, like, well, what's, what's this statue here for? He says, wow, this guy actually took responsibility for his own actions. <laughs> well, that would be, yeah, that'd be a statue. Yeah, who's going to do that? Well, you are all required to do that. It's a requirement in society that you take responsibility for your own actions. You're trusted not to hurt other people physically. The whole idea behind abuse situations is abuse from a person in an area of trust. Right, wait a minute. You are to be trusted to not hurt anybody. You're to be trusted to not hurt somebody. How do you know you're an adult when you're not hurting people? Now, my wife made me put physically up there. Why? Because is it required of us? We're trusted not to hurt other people soulishly? Hurt other people emotionally? Have we done that? Okay, so the, the issue is it's a little harder to see how people are hurting people soulishly, emotionally, mentally, okay? It's pretty simple to see if somebody hurts somebody physically, okay? Uh, I went to um, my buddy Gary, uh, is the the drama coach and the drama teacher, acting teacher, down at Front Range Christian School. And um, so I went down there this last week to do some classes for him. He wants me to come in and I do makeup theatrical makeup classes and show them demonstration of what theatrical makeup is. And it's just kind of a fun thing to take these kids and, and do stuff with them with makeup. I have an hour and a half to just do just about anything I want to in demonstration mode in theatrical makeup. Okay? One of the fun things I do is to get one of the pretty little girls up there and they've got skin that is gorgeous. I mean, translucent. Just, you know, that, that 14-year-old... Yeah, yeah, just like, isn't that sad? Make them old. That's so fun to do, to take some... some girl. She couldn't make a wrinkle if her life depended on it. And they try. They really try. It's just so funny to do. And, they can, and then to make them all old on only just one half of their face. That's fun to do. Okay? But one of the other things that's fun to do is to take somebody and make, give them a black eye. And give them bruises. You be a black guy here and then the bottom lip on this side and just beat them up. So, you know, I beat up kids for a living, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> okay. I did that once at, um, I was doing um, makeup for uh, a charity down in downtown Denver. We were down at a bank downtown. And I'm there and we have a, a booth set up for Halloween and we're making up all these different things that we were, you know, we could make and anybody into just about anything sitting at that, that booth. We had all the prosthetics all made up and everything. Everything was ready. And this woman walked up to me and she was beautiful, stunningly beautiful. She, her clothes, the suit she had on cost more than I usually got paid in a month. Okay. I mean, she just, she was decked out. And she walked up and she says, can you beat me up? All righty, yeah, just, sure, lady, pow. <coughs> and I says, I said, well, yeah, she says, can you give me some bruises and stuff? I said, sure. So I said, I wasn't on the list, and I said, she said, I'll pay whatever you want, doesn't matter. So I did the same thing, okay, we're big, we're black eye. And one of the things you can do with the makeup is you can just do it in such a way that it looks swollen. And you can swell something, I mean, it's just not swollen at all, it's just drawn on. It just, it looks really neat, their lip is all swollen out, and their eyes all swollen, and it just all looks just really neat. So I did this to her, and and put a little cut on it and stuff and just had a little fun and she paid good for the charity thing and then she left and I didn't think anything of it. Well, she went upstairs to a annual business meeting that they were having where everybody was coming in from everywhere. All these fancy executives for this company. She was an executive secretary. She was the CEO's top secretary. And she walked into this board meeting after lunch. She walked in with her hand over her face like this so nobody could see it. She just walked in and sat down in her place and just went like this. She went, <laughs> 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 and they said, 
Margaret, are, are you okay? And she just went, well, like, and here she's all beat up. And they all went, whoa, get the corporate lawyers, get the cops, call 911, we're going to find this guy. Boy, who's that your husband? All of a sudden, this guy's poor guy didn't even know, right? And here's just, and then she started laughing. Ha, <laughs> ha, got you. It's Halloween. There's a guy down in the lobby that did this. It's all makeup. Isn't this really cool? About an hour and a half later, I had this line of 20 or 30, the most beautiful women you've ever seen in your life, standing up in line, ready to get beat up. <laughs> Such a life. I don't know. But you can tell when somebody hurts somebody physically, there's evidence. Okay? You're trusted as an adult to not be hurting people. You're also a trusted adult to willingly help others. An adult is one who willingly helps other people. If somebody came in and said, uh, hi, I, my car's stuck in the parking lot. It wouldn't be the kids who would go out and help them. Chances are, it's the adults. Some of the men would. It happened to Mary Lou just last Thursday night. She got stuck out there and Jim had to go out and dig her out. And it was just, okay, it's an adult thing. Now, this is the... We, didn't, we hadn't dug out the redemption building road out of the, the other, and Jared was coming to do some work over there, and he has an office over over here. And he took his little car, and he went up the road and around the circle about 75% of it, maybe 80, 90, and then uh, there it was. No forward, no backward. Halfway down, I was like, this was not a good idea. <laughs> but I'm sort of committed. I'm like, Stop now. So I just kept going. So, I almost made it through. <laughs> We had to go get George and just dig him out. This is pretty funny. But the issue is, when I asked Jim the other day in the, in the restaurant, this was the thing that he brought up, is somebody who's going to help people. An adult is a person who w just does this, doesn't think about it. An adult is, is, does what is needed to live a normal life. You are required to just do what is needed. There's certain things you have to do. You have to, you know, take care of your house. You have to take care of your, you got to maintain your car. There's certain things you have to do to take care of life. And who's that put on? That's not put on the kids to do. That's put on the adults to do. Now, how do you know when somebody is an adult? When they're doing the things that are necessary to live life. Now, when you go into somebody's house and their house is just a total wreck and they don't know how to clean, somebody said they never were taught that. If they were taught that, a real normal adult would clean, okay, would do certain things. A, an adult responds correctly. Oh, forget that one. Forget that one. <laughs> how, are, how are we doing here? An adult owns up to their mistakes and corrects them. Now, you know that when you find somebody that never owns up to their mistakes and never corrects them, do you trust them to be the person in charge? No, they have taken themselves out of being an adult. Isn't that amazing? Even no matter, see, it doesn't matter how old somebody is, right? I know some 40-year-old guys and I know some 12-year-old men. You know, just boys. Amazing. An adult fulfills what they say they will do. I remember there was a time when the standard of a real man was one whose word was his bond. If he said he was going to do it, he was there. I don't see that as much anymore. I see all sorts of excuses and other things that make so the person can't do it, but boy, there used to be a day. And my dad used to run um, contracts that way. A verbal contract was a good contract. If somebody said they were going to pay you a certain thing, they would. Start the work. You remember that? huh? You think that's still happening today? <laughs> I, everything's better be in writing, you know, and it's just like, wow. An adult works to supply for the family and to pay the bills. You, you, you do try to pay the bills. Now, I know it's not always easy, and you get behind, you do stuff, but an adult is a person who is working hard to try to get that done. They take the responsibility of the things that are around them. They know they have to pay the bills. They, they do that. An adult is the one who cares for those who are under them. Now, it's not just people that are under them. An adult is a person who takes care of their dogs and cats and horses and pigs and chickens. And goldfish. And goldfish. <laughs> Jim's making it personal because he has goldfish, okay? Like, but you take care of those things that are underneath you. 
You take care of them. You are held responsible to take care of things. An adult is a person who lives within law. See, when a person breaks the law and gets caught, he's taken out of being in a position of, a, of being an adult. He's being put in a position of being an underling. No longer is he in, in authority. You understand what I'm saying? Taken away. You, you, you follow him, right? Am I right? Gotcha. All right. Oh, an adult is one who does what is right, even if it's inconvenient. Now, you understand what this is. This is our mature attitudes, aren't they? They're attitudes of what a mature person would be like. This is maturity in the natural. Uh, an adult is one who protects others from harm. How do I know that? Because they say, don't do this without adult supervision. <laughs> now, see, and it says this on fireworks. <laughs> and, and the adults are the dangerous ones, okay? <laughs> I don't know. And there are some of us who are supposed to be adults and on fireworks or uh, just kind of, yeah, just ter certain... Certain toys turn you back into boys. It's just like, if it's going to blow up, I'm in. You know? <laughs> this is gonna be, I am, <laughs> and at that point, I can just feel the maturity oozing out of me. It's lighted on fire. Yes. Okay. okay. Protects others from harm. All right. We're going. <laughs> Uh, there are times I'm looking for an adult to, to take care of me. Uh, <laughs> there, that's what I'm looking for, my wife. Okay. An adult can be trusted to fulfill their duties. Now, this is something that we try to train our kids into. We try to do this. Okay, make your bed, clean your room, pick up the dishes, do your chores. Why? Because we're actually training them in maturity, training them to do the things they need to do because there will come a time when they will not have mommy and daddy to take care of them. And all of a sudden they are required to take care of themselves because they are considered an adult. How many of us therefore are adults? Okay, are we taking on the responsibility of the maturity level? Were we ever trained to do all this? See, we should have been. That's what parenting is about, is training children to become an adult. That's what the blessing at the coming of age is about, blessing them to become under the training of becoming an adult. The bar mitzvah does not make them an adult. The bar mitzvah sets them up to be trained as an adult. Okay? Pretty heavy. This is in the natural in our society and in our culture. This is, just, this is just normal. This is just some of the things I came up with as I'm just thinking about it. You know, what would, what would be the earmarks of the standard of an adult? There it is, okay? Now, we expect this standard in people who are in charge. Do you feel that setup happening? Do you feel that? <laughs> Has the Lord called you into ministry? Anybody want to hit the back door now before it gets really bad? It's, here we go. It's, this is a setup. Absolutely. Yeah. We expect this from people in charge. Hey, if you're in charge, there is a standard by which is expected. You want to know what's really bad? Is that standard is not different for those who are in charge and those who are not in charge. The standard is the same That's right. for every adult. But we really expect it for those people in charge. And we get upset if they don't do it. Oh, man, if somebody doesn't do what, they're, what we think they're supposed to do, man, we get cranky, don't you? So we hold them accountable. We hold them accountable. We don't, <laughs> but we don't like it when we're held accountable. I'll not, don't tell me what to do. Don't, don't limit me, but we really like to hold those in accountability. We hold others to a higher standard than we hold ourselves. We do hold others to a higher standard than we hold ourselves. You know, uh, we were talking about this just recently. Is that there is a certain standard people expect of the pastor. I'm sorry, but there's nothing in the scripture that says the pastor is held to a different 
standard than any other Christian on the planet. So if you're expecting it of me, you should be expecting it of you. Isn't yeah, that smooth? Yeah. <laughs> okay. None of us want the scrutiny. We just don't want the scrutiny. Nobody wants to be examined in detail on this thing. We want the comfort of others doing it for us. My entire life, I kept waiting for my dad to show up and get it done. One day, I finally understood that, wow, I was the same age he was when I was born. And I was still expecting my dad to show up. And then came the day I found out that I was taking care of him more than he was taking care of me. I'm sitting there going, who's the adult in this? It's supposed to be my dad. No, no. The standard is, what was that? The circle of life. The circle of life. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mufasa. <laughs> Or are you the little monkey guy? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> or probably closer to Simba, right? No, no. It's like, okay. <laughs> or Pumba. That was nasty. Very, very accurate, but nasty. Okay. While we're messing up, the pressure to be an adult is overwhelming. The pressure of being an adult is a little overwhelming. And listen, there is nothing like sitting there in your living room knowing that you don't have enough money to pay a bill. The pressure of that has hit so many of us so heavy and you're held responsible for it and you know that somebody is going to come to you for it. Do you feel the pressure? Yeah, me too. I understand. I do, I do. I dearly do. I understand. Folks, do you understand what this idea behind maturity is all about? No. Theoretically, yes. The idea behind this is that we have to see and understand that there is a level of maturity. Well, let's take it into an understanding. I really want to show you some of these things. And one of these things I'm going to be giving today is a new thought for me that kind of blew my little head just this week kind of a ooh really Matthew 11 28 through 30 Jesus said come to me all those laboring and being burdened and I will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am meek and lowly in heart and you will find rest to your souls for my yoke is easy my burden is light now let's look at this come to me all those laboring the word laboring there is intended for doing your own work all those that labor. This is the work that you are intended to do. It's your job. It's what you are already set up to do. Come on, all those are laboring. And then it says, and being burdened. Well, this is the stuff that's placed on you by others. Now, when you take on your own load, and then you take on the load of others throwing it on you, guess what happens? You're overwhelmed. You are under the burden of it. Now, <laughs> or it's a load that you're not intended to carry. Whether you put it or somebody else. Yeah, whether you put it or somebody else puts it, it's still a load you're not intended to carry. There's a difference in the, in the grammar of which direction they're heading. Okay? Now, there's another place that says uh, we need to uh, bear our own burdens and we need to bear the burdens of others. Okay, does the same thing. We are required to do these things. But I think it's kind of fascinating here. He says, come to me, all those are labor and being burdened. Now, who is that? Anybody here relate to that? Does that seem to be you? Okay. Well, hey. He says, come to me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now, the language of this yeah, we understand what a yoke is. A yoke is something that you stick an animal's head through and you attach all the plow or carriage or cart or whatever it is to that, and it helps him pull. The yoke. Okay? Well, in the language of the day, in the society that Jesus was talking about then, it was also known as 
what a certain rabbi's beliefs and way of living was, was called his yoke. If you went to Rabbi Shama and you were being discipled by him, then you took on the yoke of Shama. And you were therefore labeled under him as being Shama's disciple. And you have taken on his yoke, his way of living, his way of understanding things, his way of, of knowing the scripture, his way of applying it. Jesus says, now I want you to come to me and take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I want you to learn how I do it. I want you to learn my way of understanding. I want you to come be a... Be a be, 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 be. <laughs> I want you to come be a disciple under my understanding. How cool is that? He says, take my yoke. Now, I want you to learn of me. I want you to come and take on my way of living. Learn of me because I am meek. Now, this is the one word that people just, just don't like. Meek is not weak. Meek is the Greek word praeotes, and it means to be submitted to authority and empowered by that authority. To be meek means to have absolutely no agenda of your own. To be under the agenda and the authority of someone else. To submit. Oh, now that's the word. That's Christian cussing. As soon as you bring up the S word, you know, S word, submission. Ugh. Nobody likes that word. But Jesus says, I want you to learn of me because I am meek. I am not talking about my own agenda. I'm talking about my father's agenda. You want to do it right? Come learn of me because I'm going to show you how to be meek. You're going to be submitted to God. And then he says, and lowly in heart. Anybody here ever get mad? Get angry? Anybody? Both of you? A few, a few more? Yeah, yeah, Brent says, yeah, I admit it. Okay. Why did you get angry? Because somebody came against your godhood. They came against what you thought was your right. They did something and you got upset at it. Well, all of a sudden, you raised up in your elevation over them, and your heart was raised up. And you went, oh, yeah, how dare you do that to me? The implication, how dare you do that to the great and awesome me from your lowly level of existence? You know it's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. What would he have to do? Because he's meek and lowly in heart. He's submitted and has no personal agenda and can be humble. Do you remember what it was like for Jesus to be crucified? How the Bible says in prophecy that as a lamb before his shears, his slaughterers, was dumb, he opened not his mouth. Didn't say a word. He didn't defend himself. He didn't. Actually, some of the things he said to Pilate was just downright mean. And I love what he said. He says, well, are you a king? He says, well, you say I am. He didn't defend himself. He said, well, you say I am. He says, oh, if my kingdom were of this world, my, my people would fight. Nobody's fighting. So, so you're a king. Oh, yeah. But it's okay. I'm submitted under your jurisdiction. From that time on, Pilate tried to get him loose. Couldn't. Because God had a plan. Jesus was meek and lowly in heart. He was submitted and humble and went toward it. Now, he had issues with that. That's what Gethsemane was all about. It took him a long time. He stood there and he says, I don't want to do this. Boy, nobody submits to crucifixion easily. He says, but... It's not my will. And he kept convincing himself. It's not my will. It's not what I want. But your will be done. It's what you want to do. He was meek and lowly in heart. Could he have been angry? Did anybody actually do something against him that night? Could he have been angry? Yeah. I like the way he told the disciples. He says, come on, guys. I could call 12 legions of angels. You understand what I have at my command? No. Twelve legions of angels. He says, one angel is going to kick all of you out. <laughs> <clears throat> and I got twelve legions. A legion was around a thousand. Twelve thousand angels. Read the book, man. You find out how much damage just one angel does. And you find out twelve legions? Oh, yeah, like we're going to just, you know, uh-huh. He says, but if you do it my way... You will find rest to your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. 
If you submit, it's easy load. It's when you don't submit that it's not an easy load. So we've got to learn to do it Jesus' way. So this whole thing we're talking about is something that can be done, but it's got to be done His way. The growth process isn't easy unless you do it in Jesus. You say, it can be easy? Certainly. If you're submitted. That's the one. If you're submitted to the process, it's going to be easy. If you're not submitted to the process, it's going to be hard. I think this is also part of the conversation that Jim and I were having the other day. He says, no, we can do this the easy way. Or we can do it this the hard way. But you know that God is sitting there saying, okay, it's fine. Not a problem to me. I have all time in my hands. You're limited and I have patience. So you want to mess with me? Fine. We can do this the hard way. Or we can do it the easy way. Or you can say it this way. We can either do it your way or we can do it my way. God's good at that, right? He's shaking us up. Why? Because we can do it his way. It's the way he wants it done. You must learn it from him. You got to learn it from him personally. That's what this thing is all about, is walking with him personally. Personally. Okay. Matthew 13, 10 through 17. And coming near, the disciples said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And answering, he said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but has not been given to those. Has that ever bothered you? Yeah. <laughs> bothers me. I understand why. I understand why. It still bothers me, but, I still un but I'm getting to the point where I really understand why. He says, because relationship was the is issue. He says, I've been given you to know the mysteries of the kingdom because it's built on relationship. He says, they want to take everything and turn it back into religion. And that's the way it's not going to work. Yes. They're trying to seek the religion of it. He says, so I'm going to give it to them in parables. Because they're going to just take the thing and try to turn it into a religion. He says, no, I want them to get this in parables and stories and understanding. He says, so they get it the right way. And then he says, and the disciples, they want to know the kingdom because they've been around Jesus and they're trying to see what the real value of this thing is. Then he says, for whoever has to him will be given and he who will have overabundance. And whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. Because of this, I speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. This is fascinating. Okay, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because i got somewhere else I'm headed. But do you understand? See the difference between what Jesus is doing and what they were expecting him to do. Okay? They're expecting him to come and be, get rid of the Roman opposition, uh, occupation. He wanted, they, they wanted Jesus and for all sorts of different things. But he came to help him die. Okay? Ugh. It wasn't working. Heart issues is the whole issue here. They had heart issues. Doesn't seem fair, but it is just. See, if you look at it really correctly, you look at the way things, when people start saying it's not fair, Satan is the one that brings up a thing about fair. God's the one that brings up things that is just. It has nothing to do with what's fair. It is what is just. You already said it. That's what it is. It's just. Wow, that's impressive. <clears throat> but the people here, they could have what the disciples had. Jesus kept offering it to them, kept explaining it to them, kept preaching about it, but he knew they weren't going to get it until after the resurrection. Okay? When the Holy Spirit came. He knew that, that was what's going to be the big issue. Then he says, The prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled on them, which says, In hearing you will hear and in no way understand, and seeing you will see and in no way perceive. For the heart of this people has grown fat, and they heard heavily with the ears, and they have closed their eyes, that they not see with their eyes, and hear with the ears, and understand with their heart, and be converted, and I heal them. And this always has sounded like God is saying, No, I don't want to heal them. But what he's saying here is, He's got others that need to be healed, and if he gave it to just them... They wouldn't, didn't want to go to the Gentiles. They didn't want it to go to anybody else. He says, no, there's a bigger thing happening. A great bigger thing happening. And he says, I don't want them to just be converted and just them be healed and then ignore everybody else. I've got a greater pasture. I've got other flock that I must reach also. He says, and so this is what's happening. But here's the deal. Um, for the heart of this people has... Grown fat. No, 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 no. 
grown fat. In other words, it wasn't, but it has now grown that way. It shows a process. They were open at one point, but now it has grown fat. Now, you, you follow on here? It's a process. In other words, they have taken it, instead of taking it into maturity, they've taken it the other direction. They have processed it into the bad, instead of processing it into the good. Instead of becoming mature, they become less. They've grown that way. They've grown that way. But your eyes are blessed because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly, I tell you that many prophets and righteous ones desired to see what you see, and did not see, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear. He said, but you guys are blessed. You're here on this to build a relationship with me and gain the salvation that God has purchased. You get what you want, what you really want. And this in, there, herein lies the problem. You want to rule your own little kingdom? You get it. I'm serious. You want to rule and reign your own little kingdom and keep God out of your life? Fine. You get it. You really do get what you want. Now, except for the consequences. You also get the consequences of what you want. Yeah, that's the hard part. We have access to something much, much bigger now, the actual kingdom of God. But we must do it Jesus' way. Now, in Matthew chapter 24, this is, this, is, this is wild. Jesus is going into the temple. He's there. And they're all showing him the temple, saying, Isn't this gorgeous? It's beautiful. Look at this. this gorgeous. And he says, Man, he says, There will not be one rock left on another right here. Are you kidding? This is all falling apart. This is all down. And they, they went, really? And they said, well, would you tell us the signs of the times? Would you show us what is going to come? And they start asking him these questions. Well, Jesus starts saying, and he says this. And answering, Jesus said to them, See that not any lead you astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. And they will cause many to be led astray. But you are going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. See and do not be terrified. For all things must take place, but the end is not yet. The end is not yet. We have been warned. These things are coming. Okay? But there is a plan for survival. Watch this. It goes on. <laughs> it says, For nation will be rised against nation. Sound familiar? Anybody watch the news lately? And kingdom against kingdom. This isn't just man's kingdom. This is spiritual kingdoms and physical kingdoms. And this is the whole thing. And there will be famines and plagues and earthquakes against many places. But all these are just a beginning of throws. Then they will deliver you up to affliction and will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations because of my name. Now, here's where it gets really very, very interesting. We know that there will be a time coming. We know that there is a time coming when there's going to be persecution hitting the body of Christ. Now, we think it's tough now, but it's not. Not even close yet. But just this last two weeks, 28 congregations, 28 Christian churches have been kicked out of the schools in New York City. The New York City has decided that they will not allow a church to be in the schools anymore. And so just like that, within two weeks, 28 congregations are out on the street. Okay. One of them said, fine, we'll meet on the street. Now, he met on the street in front of the school, which is legal. Totally there. 300 people showed up for church. Okay. It's going to get like this, folks. It's getting to the point where everything they're talking about, the separation of church and state, things are going to get wilder and weirder and weirder and wilder. And now the whole issue, if you follow politics at all, which I tend to not do because I get sick of it quick, Okay, really quick. My appetite for that is right up there with cottage cheese. I think we're right. <laughs> God bless America. Okay, but I, oh God. I listen to this stuff and I, I watch. Another thing that Jim and I were discussing, people keep saying, you can't legislate morality. Excuse me? What do you mean you can't legislate morality? Somebody, let me ask you a question. Is it illegal to murder somebody? Pretty much. It is illegal. It is illegal. Is there legislation against murder? Yes. Yeah. Is it immoral to murder somebody? Yes. I guess they legislated morality, didn't they? Uh huh. Every single law that's on the books is a moral thing. 
Every single one. And they're starting to tell us now you can't legislate morality. You can't tell us what to do. You know, if we want to be homosexuals, we want to do all this sort of stuff, you can't legislate morality. Yeah, you can. Fact is, that's what all, it all, it's all about. But I watch the political stuff, and I'll tell you, all of a sudden, everybody wants, everybody wants abortions to be across the board. They want abortions to be fine. They want homosexuals to be married. They want everybody to have sex with everybody. But if one of the candidates has sex outside of his marriage, they shoot him down. You understand, nations are going to go crazy, and they're going to start persecuting Christians. Now, here's the part that is a new thought for me, and I never saw this up here. But understand that this is what we're signed up for. We're signed up to be persecuted. We're signed up to be taken down. We're signed up to kill, be killed. That's the whole idea. I mean, it's really coming down to that. That's what we're signed up for, okay? There is no false security here, folks. So just because you're a Christian, nothing's going to, bad's ever going to happen to you, Right? Wrong. Okay, we're in for trouble. But I never saw it this way, but look, it goes on. It says, and then many will be offended. And they will deliver one another and hate one another. Wait a minute. The first was a persecution against the believers. And now it's the believers who are offended turning each other in. I've never seen it quite that way. I knew that the Bible says that there will be a great falling away. But that falling away is going to be, we're going to be persecuted from those inside the church, yep. not just outside. Yep. This is why we've been pushing to make sure the church is known, the people have known. What we preach all over the place is that this has got to be a relationship. It's got to be a relationship, and there's got to be no religion. The religion is what's going to get us killed. Okay, we've got to know that that's happening. It says, so then many will be offended and they will deliver up one another and will hate one another. And many false prophets will be raised and, and cause many to err. This is from the inside. False prophets raised up in our own midst, causing many to err. And because lawlessness shall have been multiplied, the love of the many will grow cold at once at one time, it was hot. And now, because of this stuff, their love will grow cold. It shows a process that is being accomplished. My thing is and how closely it comes to the point of true loving. Yes. Okay, if the love of many goes cold, and which is the same thing, by the way, because the true love is God commends his love towards us from while we were here at Sinners Christ died for us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that we could go on. Okay, the understanding, though, is not about God loving me, but it's about me loving others. And if my love grows cold, then God can't use me. I will be twisted, and I will go the wrong direction. So why do we need to know about maturity? Because our love doesn't grow cold. So our love doesn't grow cold. And it says, because lawlessness shall have been multiplied. What is lawlessness? Lawlessness says you can't make me do anything. You can't tell me what to do. That's lawlessness. There's no law that I have to obey. See what I'm going at? See, Am I making the right circle here? We're coming down to the understanding. It shows process and eventual outcome. I like it. It says, but the one who endures to the end, that one will be kept safe. Folks, we've got to understand that we can walk this thing out. How? By being a mature Christian, by being solid into the understanding of what God wants to do and submitted to it. We're going to see how this thing works. That's what we're going to be talking about. We have a choice, hot or cold love, which one you want to have. So we need to know how to get there. We need to know what the Bible says about it. We need to know how to get there because it is mandatory. It is mandatory. It is no longer acceptable to just have your nominal Christianity and walk your life out and die and go home to Jesus. That is no longer an option. It is now the option is that we're going to have to get strong. We're going to have to be absolutely walking in maturity. The world needs us to grow in the right way. Oh, they need to find the mature sons of God. The mature sons of God. We've seen enough of the wrong kind of growth. Remember the quote out of uh, Lord of the Rings when they asked uh, one of the hobbits, you know, 
He says, well, I'm not going to, he was putting on a, an outfit that was made for a boy, and he says, well, I'm not going to grow anymore. He says, except maybe sideways. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, I understand. But even that growth, I don't want to grow fat. We just read a verse about it. Mm-hmm. I don't want my heart to grow fat. I, I think we need to exercise our godliness. I think we need to really start pushing for this thing. Um, nobody... There's no such thing as the fat pill, where you just take a pill and all of a sudden you're slim and trim. It still requires exercise. It still requires eating correctly. It still requires certain things. For one, it requires us to get rid of all the old junk out of our lives and get our lives straightened out. That's the big part, but really what it comes down to is you're going to have to exercise. And as Christians, we're going to have to exercise, huh? Okay, yeah. Now, how do we grow the right way? Oh, well, I think we're going to be finding that out. How do we prepare for what is coming? Well, that's kind of like where I'm heading. Okay? What does the Scripture have to say about this? Wow. That's it. That was my introduction. So, next week we start on this thing. Uh, To be absolutely continued. We're going to be answering all these questions. We're going to be digging in with scriptures. And you got to understand, I really did the law of Roxanne. The rule of Roxanne was really empowering me this week because I didn't, I said, okay, I can't do this when it's a passage. You can't do this passage. You can't do this. I was just looking for single verses, things that kind of like set up the introduction. Lord, how do you want Because I'm not going to get into this. I'm going to take it slow and easy. I always say that at the beginning of every series. <laughs> and then by the middle of them heading, you know, okay. But that's what we're trying for. Do you understand where we're going? Oh, yeah. Make sense? Oh, yeah. Look like a good plan? Yeah. Are you in? Yeah. <laughs> they said they're in, Lord. Here we go. Well, let's pray. Because this is what we're going for, guys. I think that this is a, a time, a very timely message for us right now on where we're heading. We're going to have to be mature. We're going to have to make the right kind of decisions and not be swayed by stupid stuff. Amen? Amen. Stupid stuff. That's a technical term. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that you are wanting us to grow up in you. That you want us to become the mighty men of God, the mighty women of your power. Lord, that you are calling us to be more than we've ever been. And there's a reason, Lord, because dangerous times are coming. And Lord, I want us prepared to be able to walk on and our love will not grow cold. And we will be the ones who are able to be used of you to touch hearts and to touch people and live it. And Lord, for all these things, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. You are a mighty, awesome God. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.